Section 38. I cannot at this place avoid a sigh. There are days when I am visited by a feeling blacker than the blackest melancholy, contempt of man. Let me leave no doubt as to what I despise, whom I despise. It is the man of today, the man with whom I am unhappily contemporaneous. The man of today, I am suffocated by his foul breath. Toward the past, like all who understand, I am full of tolerance, which is to say, generous self-control. With gloomy caution I pass through whole millenniums of this madhouse of a world, call it Christianity, Christian faith, or the Christian church, as you will. I take care not to hold mankind responsible for its lunacies, but my feeling changes and breaks out irresistibly the moment I enter modern times, our times. Our age knows better. What was formerly merely sickly now becomes indecent. It is indecent to be a Christian today. And here my disgust begins. I look about me. Not a word survives of what was once called truth. We can no longer bear to hear a priest pronounce the word. Even a man who makes the most modest pretensions to integrity must know that a theologian, a priest, a pope of today, not only errs when he speaks, but actually lies, and that he no longer escapes blame for his lie through innocence or ignorance. The priest knows, as everyone knows, that there is no longer any God, or any sinner, or any saviour, that free will and the moral order of the world are lies. Serious reflection, the profound self-conquest of the spirit, allow no man to pretend that he does not know it. All the ideas of the church are now recognized for what they are, as the worst counterfeits in existence, invented to debase nature and all natural values. The priest himself is seen as he actually is, as the most dangerous form of parasite, as the venomous spider of creation. We know our conscience now knows just what the real value of all those sinister inventions of priest and church has been, and what ends they have served, with their debasement of humanity to a state of self-pollution, the very sight of which excites loathing. The concepts, the other world, the last judgment, the immortality of the soul, the soul itself, they are all merely so many instruments of torture, systems of cruelty, whereby the priest becomes master and remains master. Everyone knows this, but nevertheless things remain as before. What has become of the last trace of decent feeling, of self-respect, when our statesmen, otherwise an unconventional class of men, and thoroughly anti-Christian in their acts, now call themselves Christians and go to the communion table? A prince at the head of his armies, magnificent as the expression of the egoism and arrogance of his people, and yet acknowledging without any shame that he is a Christian. Whom, then, does Christianity deny? What does it call the world? To be a soldier, to be a judge, to be a patriot, to defend oneself, to be careful of one's honor, to desire one's own advantage, to be proud, every act of every day, every instinct, every valuation that shows itself in a deed, is now anti-Christian, what a monster of falsehood the modern man must be to call himself, nevertheless, and without shame, a Christian. Section 39. I shall go back a bit and tell you the authentic history of Christianity. The very word Christianity is a misunderstanding. At bottom, there was only one Christian, and he died on the cross. The Gospels died on the cross. What from that moment onward was called the Gospels was the very reverse of what he had lived— Bad tidings, a disangelium, translators note 14, so in the text, one of Nietzsche's numerous coinages, obviously suggested by evangelium, the German for gospel, end of note 14. It is an error amounting to nonsensicality to see in faith, and particularly in faith in salvation through Christ, the distinguishing mark of the Christian. Only the Christian way of life, the life lived by him who died on the cross, is a Christian, to this day such a life is still possible, and for certain men even necessary. Genuine, primitive Christianity will remain possible in all ages. Not faith, but acts, above all, an avoidance of acts, a different state of being. States of consciousness, faith of a sort, the acceptance, for example, of anything as true. As every psychologist knows, the value of these things is perfectly indifferent and fifth-rate compared to that of the instincts. 
Strictly speaking, the whole concept of intellectual causality is false. To reduce being a Christian, the state of Christianity, to an acceptance of truth, to a mere phenomenon of consciousness, is to formulate the negation of Christianity. In fact, there are no Christians. The Christian, he who for two thousand years has passed as a Christian, is simply a psychological self-delusion. Closely examined, it appears that, despite all his faith, he has been ruled only by his instincts. And what instincts? In all ages, for example, in the case of Luther, faith has been no more than a cloak, a pretense, a curtain behind which the instincts have played their game, a shrewd blindness to the domination of certain of the instincts. I have already called faith the specially Christian form of shrewdness, People always talk of their faith and act according to their instincts. In the world of ideas of the Christian, there is nothing that so much as touches reality. On the contrary, one recognizes an instinctive hatred of reality as the motive power, the only motive power at the bottom of Christianity. What follows therefrom? That even here, in psychologesis, there is a radical error, which is to say one conditioning fundamentals, which is to say one in substance. Take away one idea and put a genuine reality in its place, and the whole of Christianity crumbles to nothingness. Viewed calmly this strangest of all phenomena, a religion not only depending on errors, but inventive and ingenious only in devising injurious errors, poisonous to life and to the heart, this remains a spectacle for the gods. For those gods who are also philosophers, and whom I have encountered, for example, in the celebrated dialogues at Naxos. At the moment when their disgust leaves them, and us, they will be thankful for the spectacle afforded by the Christians. Perhaps because of this curious exhibition alone, the wretched little planet called the Earth deserves a glance from omnipotence, a show of divine interest. Therefore, let us not underestimate the Christians. The Christian, false to the point of innocence, is far above the ape. In its application to the Christians, a well-known theory of descent becomes a mere piece of politeness.